two two beats at the end of forty four, and by that time we were ready to take over and move them in and so forth. Now in that group there were fifty five who already had PhDs. You see. Mm-hmm. So it was a very good group. The only one I had any trouble with had been a district attorney in Indiana and a Republican politician. <laughs> and I had trouble with him over certain things. For example, the civil war in Spain. I gave him the, the truth of the civil war in Spain. I mean, this was not a communist revolt against the Catholic Church or something like this. You see, and that's what this guy was. So uh, this is the substance of the book, Tragedy and Hope. Do you Did see? you know why you were working this? No, day? no, no. I was just trying to, you know, keep a day to day basis. You, you realize at the end of the accumulation. <clears throat> Research and well, yes, I know. Uh, I know. I have a lot more about most of this than most people. Mm-hmm. Now, I then spent 20 years writing it, from 45 to 65, and put it in. Do you see? In 65. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, I had written a shorter book, which 15 publishers had rejected. And I had set it aside. I wrote it the first time in the only summer I had off, which was 1942. And that whole period, I went for 20 years without any time off. No sabbaticals, no anything. From 42 to uh, 61. I took off and went to England and did research. And then I got another sabbatical in 71, uh, when I came to England on the sabbatical. And I only, and so they own me sabbatical time once I'll get it. I've asked for uh, one semester of sabbatical before I retire. That seems to me like a full pay for one semester. It seems to be a half pay or whatever it is. I don't know what it is. And I can't even look in. I don't have time, have time to look in. But in any case, I uh, worked out all of these things, and my first book had been rejected by 15 publishers. I had written it first in the summer of 34. I then spent the summer of 42 in Princeton in Donald Starfer's and he died as Eastern Professor of Literature at Oxford after climbing the Pyrenees, running up and down the Pyrenees. And uh, I re- wrote it in 42. Then I set that aside and wrote it a third time, just dashed it off. And that is the book of the Evolution of Civilizations. It's only 279 pages, but it's still the best thing. And there are a number of books that quote it as the best thing on why civilizations rise and fall and how they do and so forth. So it's a big thing to see. Now, this uh, was since 1914, covers 70 years, from 1895 to 1965, and it's in that way, but it covers the whole world. So again, it's a pretty big thing because it goes into science and technology, as you will discover if you start reading the paperback, and uh, economics, and as you see, I can do more in economics than economists. Yeah. One thing that intrigued me, well, just last mm-hmm. night, my wife and I was talking about you, was the title of the book, Tragedy and, and Hope. Hope. Yes, because it's such I, a large title. Yes. Now, what it means is this. I think it is absolutely tragic. It is shameful. It is sinful that Western civilization is going to go down the drain. When I wrote that book, which is less than 10 years ago, I had hope that we could save Western civilization. I am extremely skeptical now that it can be saved. I think we're just about finished. And I just threw a few things out here this morning in the class. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, if we're going to allow a coal strike and yeah. if, we, if we're going to overthrow the Portuguese government. Because as soon as we, all these military dictatorships are not going to last. And so we get rid of a democracy because it wants to be a little liberal. Mm-hmm. And we put in a military dictatorship, but then collapses. And what happens? The communists come in. This is what happened in Portuguese. Salazar was there since 1927. You see? Mm-hmm. All right, now they suddenly try to establish some kind of a non-military dictatorship. He wasn't a military, he was a college professor, but he was supported by uh, the reactionary groups. And now they want to do something about that. And the same thing could happen in Greece. They're now going to probably, in Greece, try these generals who established the military dictatorship because we got them to do it, mm-hmm. you see? And this gives the communists, and it could well be. Now, this is what's worrying Kissinger. He thinks the whole Mediterranean has going to have communists. So we're going to do, go into war to prevent this? Oh, I mean, it's sick. Well, let me go yeah. back. Now, when did you find a publisher for your book? I found a publisher instantly because the, fir- the first book, I'm a, I'm a current history, an editor, right. and I wrote, used to write a good deal for them, right. and that's who called me up one money and wants me to write about Spain today, what's going to happen in Spain, and I said I, I, it would take too much time, I don't to do it. So the people at Current History said to me, in 
60. Uh, I just mentioned I had this book. Uh, I had many books. I have a whole lot of books. They're half written and almost wholly written, you see. And uh, they said, have you ever given it, asked Peter Ritten? And I said, I never heard of him. Who was he? He's calling up. Pat McMillan. So I'm right to the phone. I was at the American Historical Association in New York, the meeting of 1960. And I went to the phone and called McMillan and asked for Peter Ritten. And he came on and I said, I have a book. And I have somebody here who's the editor of current history who says that you would like it. And so forth. He said, send it to me. A week later, I got a letter from him. It's a marvelous book. How many pages did you send it? I sent the whole thing. Which was and well, just fat. Yeah, just about that fat. It, it came out as a book of 279 printed pages. Accepted it within a week. Which book is this then? This is the first book. First book. Okay, right, right. Okay. This is 1961. You right. find all of this in who's who. Right. You see the right. dates. Yes, you see. All right. right. That's, right. That's how I got my first book published. Now, when I signed the contract for that, 1961, mm -hmm. they uh, made me agree that I would give them my next book. Sure. You see? So in a couple of years, I said to Peter Rittner, I want the next book to be The World Since 1914. And he said, okay, uh, let's sign a contract. He's been like, that's a rather large subject, Carol. Uh, Peter Rittner thinks I am the greatest writer around. Okay. Is he an editor? He's uh, gone. That's him. Okay. You see? Now, here's what happened. And I don't know whether we want to get this on tape, but I'll put it on tape. But look, you've got to be discreet. Sure. sure. You know, you have to protect my future. Sure. As well as your own. Uh, when Tragedy and Hope was signed the contract, and right up to the last minute, which would be the spring and summer of 66, they were planning to bring it out in two volumes, boxed for 1750. Mm -hmm. Macmillan had been bought by from Harold Macmillan at the Macmillan Company of England mm -hmm. for five million, because he needed the cash. In the summer of 66, a holding company, Collier Books, which originally was Morgan, and they published Collier's Magazine. Remember Collier's Weekly and stuff like that? Collier's Books, now I don't know who controls it now, and it's one of these holding companies, mm -hmm. came in, they bought up the free press, you know, in Illinois, they bought up Montana bookstores, mm -hmm. they bought up Macmillan. They came in and they looked at what they bought and they said, you're spending money wildly, you're not taking in money, we got to stop it. They have yeah. So they said, no advertising on any books that are published for the next six months. You spent too much on advertising. And the editors like Peter Rittner screamed and said, we're not going to stay if this is the way you're going to do things. So they said, all right, one ad for each book. All right, I got one ad for Tragedy and Hope. And it was a quarter page in the New York Times uh, book review, I believe. That's all. I spoke with Rittner. R-I-P-N-E-N. -E Peter Rittner. He, I imagine he knows who. Uh, he should be. Anyway, he has since left them. I don't know what he is doing. He still lives in the same place that I visited him in, in Riverside Drive, up near the uh, George Washington Bridge. Mm -hmm. But he works for some world book thing or something. Yeah, world publishers. Uh, something else. And what he does, I don't know, because he's never got in touch with me since he left. And, and they also did not come out with the two lines. So. No. Uh, they, and then when they saw it, they said, oh, this is going to cost too much. Cut it to one volume and cut the price five bucks. So they that made it twelve fifty. But they never sold it at twelve fifty, they made it twelve ninety five, so this is what it was sold. Now, it went out of print, that was sixty six. It went out of print in sixty eight. But in sixty eight Collier Books got in touch with me, I don't know how or why, and said, uh, we'll bring out the last half of this as a paperback and that's what I gave you. That came out in sixty eight. Right. And that, I think, is still in print. But I'm, I can't get an answer. I can't get a straight answer to any question from them. For example, they never told me until 1974, when I was trying to fight the pirate who reprinted Tragedy and Hope, right. that it had been out of print. They told me it's out of stock, and we will republish when we get 2,000. Right. But they never could get 2,000. I told you this, haven't I? Because they were telling everybody who wrote in that it's out of print. Now, when, when, did to me, when, did, when did you realize there was a pirate edition? How did you find out? I found out when somebody got a plain envelope with a slip of paper in it, available again, in short supply, trashing and hope, the whole book, the whole book. 
and it's in a theater and it's in it. And now they called me up and said, hey, did you know that your book is reprinted? I said, which book? I said, oh, not a print it. And they said, try to hope. I said, no, it isn't. You don't know who this person was? No, no. Because it's exact copy. Exact. The dust jacket, everything, the binding is the same. Did they, uh, did they reset the cipher? Or did it photo, photo, reproduction? photo reproduction. It's exactly the same. Okay. Now, I can tell instantly that it's different. Because they didn't notice that the original had a gold, had yellow top on the pages. Yeah. All right. right. You see, the original, right. the new one is white. So you, I would imagine, would call McDonald's and say, hey, you must be obsessed with the reprint. I mean, that would be a logical thing. Well, they didn't give a damn, and I'll tell you why. But did you call, now, how much is, well, let's talk when we're done with it, I'll ask you how much of this you're comfortable with in light of your lawsuit, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, well, okay. uh, I don't, I don't we know. We talk about that. And I don't know why they're not acted like this. Now, immediately, <clears throat> But my logical reaction would be to call me and say, gee, you must really get help. I didn't. I, I, not right away, I didn't, because they had lied to me so many times and so many times. Everybody knew it was something. I there's something funny. They had lied, 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 lied to me, you see, okay. on, and, on everything. And uh, I have letters to prove that, because I have from, from written letters apologizing for information previously given to him, because they had lied to him when he called up to ask right. if they were out of print or not, you see, and they said no and so forth. Now, oh, oh, the big thing is, my contract, both had in it, that if it went out of print, I have the right to recover the plates. Right. They never got in touch with me uh, for the plates. I learned in March of this year that they destroyed the plates of Tragedy and Hope. I learned in the summer, 1971, because my wife got mad and called McMillan on the phone every week while I was in England, and finally got from them a letter in which they said, the plates had been destroyed. They had inadvertently destroyed the plates of the first book, Evolution Civilizations, you see? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you're fine. Yeah. So, a guy calls you an anonymous caller. He, he, so, well, he identified himself you know, to me, but he's made me, you know, and he gave me his name and so forth, and he had got this. And, uh, uh, you want to check that out? A second. And the way I found out was, I sent an order. I let somebody else send an order. Now, this was my assistant who uh, sent a check and uh, sent an order, and nothing came. And then we discovered they'd only pay if you sent them cash ahead of time. You see, a check wouldn't do? Well, I, I guess I did send a check. But not, not, not the whole thing. No, I sent, I sent the check, the whole thing. But they, for example, will not send to bookstores unless they send cash, and they're all suspicious. Because if you order 10 copies, and that would be $120, because you would ask him 12 uh, uh, you vanish because it's only to find out who it is. Sure. You have no name, you have a box number in California, and so forth. And anyway, I, I, I couldn't find out anything. I get, got it back, and I was shocked because it was identical. You see, almost identical. So then I got other companies were offering it. What is it? This was in the, this year. This year? Yes, January. January the 74. Okay. This year. By March, somebody came to me and had one of the pirate cops. Says, "Where'd you get it?" And they said, "Sidney Kramer." I said, "Does he have it?" And he said, "Sure, he had four or five in there." So I called up Sidney Kramer and asked if he had it, and he said, "Yes." And I went down there, and uh, it, uh, he's very hard to get information on. But finally, I found out that he sent an order in, and they sent back, uh, sent me a check, and I sent it. You see, mm -hmm. and he sold them and repeated the order, repeated the order, and so forth. So then I told our bookstore. He was in a vendor at U.S. Yes, he was using. Well, I don't know who it is. And uh, at that time, you did not know. Who I it. still am not certain. Really? Who it is? And I will now, and I'll tell you why. Uh, one of the places that was offering it for sale, and there was about five places that were offering it for sale, and I've got since a number of others you know, that they come to me from students or mm -hmm. they. They don't come right to me directly, ever. Now, no one ever approached me. Well, one reason I was suspicious of McMillan was this. The first, the fact that the radical right, the John Birch Society and so forth, was getting all up over this book mm -hmm. goes back to at least 69. I was going to ask you about that. 69. Yes, and a book appeared called The Naked Capitalist by Scoosons. Now, of that book, about a fifth of it is direct quote from my book. Yeah. Now, he says it's from my book, it's a quotation mark, but nevertheless it's a violation of copyright. Yeah. I got in touch with Macmillan, and they were 
would not do a thing. They said, I, I said, aren't you going to defend my copyright? They said, no, if you want to do something, we will support you and, uh, you know, and, and be a witness if you want and so forth. Well, I'm, I wasn't going to sue this guy. He's a professor of religion at Brigham Young University, former to the police chief of Salt Lake City. You know all about it. Yeah, all right. He's on the gamut. So whether he has, he had been the FBI for years. Right. So whether he would have any money, it wouldn't be worth my while to sue him, do you see, probably. And another state and so forth. So I decided I'd let that go, and then I discovered they wouldn't do anything. And then Congressman Rarick, who was beaten in the primary just now, put that book into uh, into the congressional record, and a lot of things like this. Then this book was distributed to every registered voter in New Hampshire. And at no point, they, they never called you and said, and after no, a quote, I mean, no, nobody ever, to be like, writing the story without ever talking to you. Yeah. Nobody ever wrote to me. Hmm? You know where they got the picture of you? From the PR officer? Uh, and I think, uh, let me see which picture it is. They tried to get pictures from the PR office, and I said, don't give anybody a picture if they won't tell you why. Mm -hmm. Oh, they got this from the PR office. Now, Scoosins couldn't get a picture of me. You see, they could have got a picture off the back of the, uh, the full picture of me, on the back of the jacket of the first book mm -hmm. from Backrack mm -hmm. here in town. But you know, that's the one they have in the public relations office here now, still. It's the only one there is, and that's where they got that. <laughs> well, it's all right, but then they put it on the same page with J.P. Morley, you know, this is a nonsense to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're laugh, right to laugh, it's a joke, but it's also silly. Yeah. They can leave it. Morgan, or with any of these people, but then they're full of statements. Anyway, Rarick and other people have filled the congressional records with this. Then the Joint Bridge Society started talking about it in their various publications. And then, of course, this guy is a John Birch employee. Okay. And he published, even before this, did he, the uh, book uh, Nixon, The Man Behind the Mask. Yeah, that's, that's in 69. I knew nothing about that until two weeks ago. Really? Nixon, The Man Behind the Mask. Yes, when one of the priests here met me and said, I've been looking for you. I said, well, look, it's free. Go ahead and look all you want. He said, no, I want to uh, ask you about this Gary Allen who wrote a book about Nixon. And I said, well, I know Gary Allen. I didn't know he wrote a book about Nixon, so I don't keep up with this stuff. And he said, well, I have it. And the whole third chapter is about you and your book, Tries to Help. I said, really? So he let me have it, and I read it, and it was. And now there's others. So you don't know Gary Allen personally. No. Now, here's, here's what happened. A crisis occurred at Brigham Young, and I should not go into it in detail because I don't know anything for sure. Yeah, I have something. All right. But I had a hell of a... It, the, the campus was blown apart by a fight between the political science department and Scoosins, in which they declared he was unworthy to be a Mormon professor and should be fired. Right. And he defended himself, and what happened, I do not know. All I know is this. He bought this. Who? He lost. Oh, he got outed. Oh, I didn't know that. You see, I never find out. Nobody ever tells me these things. <laughs> I'll check. Why don't you please talk to that guy? Quite where the rest of the is. I got off. He did get rid of him. He did. I think he lost that fight. I mean, it was the option. I never wanted to. Well, anyway, the reason all I know about it is this. I gave three papers at the American Association of Advancement of Science. I'm going to give you one of them. And because they liked it so much, they printed thousands of them, or, you know, processed thousands of them and distributed them to all the press, in the press room. They liked this one, so it wasn't the best of them. General Crises and Civilization, you know, which is this an attractive title. Now, and somebody called me up and wanted to talk to me at this, and I think it was at this, and he said his name was Larson, and he was a, a scientist from Brigham Young, and he wanted to see and talk to me because of what was going on out there. I said, well, what is going on out there? Oh, he says they have mass meetings on this, and he says it's just an uproar all the time. And I didn't know. Now, he made an interview with me, and he wanted to play it on the campus radio or the local radio station. And I said, all right. What was the interview about? About. Just about this, this, Yeah, no, about uh, the uh, oh, Scotians okay. controversy. Okay. And I said, all right, let me know what happens. But he never wrote to me. I never found out. Mm -hmm. I never made any effort. So I don't know whether it was in the broadcast or not. What was your what, why, what was your input in that? What did you have to say about the students' controversy? Well, I simply said, 
I, t I simply told him that Spookins wrote this book. He never uh, was talking about talked to me about it. He violated my copyright. It's full of lies and things that are untrue. It takes things out of context and misinterprets them. And I gave him the specific things where I disagree. The group that I'm writing about was originally, in my mind, the group established secretly by Lord Milner in 1908 and 99 called the Round Table Group, which still publishes a quarterly magazine called the Round Table in London, which is one of the world's best sources of international relations information since 1910. The first editor of it was Lord Lothian, at that time Philip Carr, K-E-R-R, -R, and uh, nobody knew this really for years. I got to know things, and I investigated that group, you see? Mm -hmm. Now, how I found it is very interesting. I noticed that prominent people in English life had fellow of All Souls College, uh, Lord Halifax, who was the uh, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, and then they made him ambassador to America. When they take the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs and makes him ambassador to Washington, which most people would consider a downward step, it shows how important they considered Washington's support would be in World War II, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a fellow of All Souls. The fellow who summoned Neville Ch uh, Chamberlain in the 10th of May, 1940, and said, for God's sake, go, was uh, Leo Amory. All right, he was a sidekick, the chief lieutenant, political lieutenant of Lord Melnick, you see. Mm -hmm. He was a fellow of all souls. And so I decided I would study all souls. This is purely historical. I got the names of all people who had been fellows of all souls since 1899 to whenever I was doing it, which would be about 1947. And there were 149 of them. I discovered most of them were fellows for only seven years, which is the regular appointment. It's for seven years. But some of them were for 55 years fellows of all sorts. A man named Dougal Malcolm, who was the head of the British South Africa Company, which is what Rhodesia, you see. And he was 55 years. I discovered that Lord Brand, who had been with Miller in South Africa, was for years, and he was the head of Lazar Brothers Bankers in London. And I discovered that Lee Langley was for years, and so forth. And above all, I discovered a man named Lionel Curtis, who had no right, whatever, to be a fellow of all souls. You get to be a fellow of all souls either because you are a very prominent person, and as an honorary thing, you will become an honorary fellow for seven years, or because you are an outstanding scholar and you get it by competitive examination when you graduate. That's how Lord Halifax got it. His name was uh, Charles Wood in 1903 when he graduated from uh, Oxford. He took a competitive examination and got it, but he's kept it. Now, I discovered he kept it because he went immediately to South Africa and met the kindergarten, which was the group of people that were running South Africa for Lord Milner, you see. They were called kindergarten because they were all young kids, mm -hmm. you see. Now, these are the ones who remain forever after, fellows of all sorts, or in Lionel Curtis's case, he's the man who said, we've got to change the name from British Empire to Commonwealth of Nations. And the reason is they had been students of Alfred Zimmern, who wrote a book in 1909 called the Greek Commonwealth, describing ancient Greece, you see? Mm -hmm. And who was the man who made Arnold Toynbee a great classical scholar, do you see? And brought him into international affairs. Now, I knew none of this. Mm -hmm. All I knew is that here, were, here was a fellow, Lionel Curtis, who was such a poor student, it took him 15 years to get his degree, and then he got it about the lowest pass degree or something that you could ever get. Mm -hmm. And, and, here he was and nobody had nobody nobody ever heard of him. Right. But he was furthermore, I later discovered, furthermore, he was Lord Halifax's roommate at All Souls for years. And then I discovered this fella is behind everything that's going on. Well, I don't care, you see. Now, I don't think we should talk too much about this. Well, no, I... Just see. All right. All right. But having discovered that, I met Alfred Zimmerman. He came here to give a speech. And I said, isn't it funny that, that All Souls, he's that's the round table group. I never heard of them. That shows how little I knew it. They've been around since 1909, published this magazine since 1910, and this is 1947. Mm -hmm. And I said, what is wrong with He named them, who they were. And he says, I was a member of them for 10 years, from 1913, and they, they added, they 
brought me in, invited me because I was in the Workers' Education Alliance. This was extension programs, night courses, summer courses for workers, Workers' Education Alliance. And he said, uh, that's why they brought me into it, and I was for 10 years, and he says, I resigned in 1923 because they were determined to build up Germany against France. He says, I wouldn't stand for it, so I resigned. Now, when I met Lord Brennan later and asked him about this, he had never seen the resignation. Now, and so I better stop talking because, you see, this gets into okay. all kinds of things. Now, this is, I knew the Round Table Group was very influential. I knew that they were the real founders of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and I knew they were the, all the stuff that's in print, that they were the real founders of the Institute of the Pacific Relations. I knew that they were the godfathers of the uh, Council of Foreign Relations here. I knew that, for example, you know the big study of history, many volumes of... Uh, I will join me. All right. I knew the manuscripts of that were stored in the Council of Foreign Relations during the war so they wouldn't be destroyed by German bombing, do you see? Mm -hmm. And so forth. And so forth. So I began to put these things together and discovered that this group was working for the following things. They were a secret group. They were working to federate the English-speaking world. The English-speaking world. They were closely linked to international bankers, and they were working to establish a world, what I call a free power world. And that free power world was the Atlantic Bloc of England and the Commonwealth of the United States, Germany, Hitler's Germany, Soviet Russia, the free power world. They said Germany we can control because boxed in, and all of this is in my book, mm. it's boxed in between the Atlantic Bloc and the Russians. The Russians will behave because they're boxed in between the Atlantic Bloc, the American Navy, and Singapore, and so forth, mm. and uh, the, the Germans, do you see? Right. And therefore, now this is all described in my book, and this was their idea. Now notice, it's a balance of power system. Mm. It's essentially what Kissinger, well, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's following everything. Mm. Because he's just a prima donna, you know, uh, emotionally unbalanced uh, person. He doesn't know what the hell he's doing, but it was a good idea. And what he should have been doing is described by me, and you really should read this, in current history for October 1968. Now, if I had a copy, I'd give it to you, but I don't have it. It is how to construct a multi-block world in which the United States would be secure, as we ever can be, and be independent and have freedom of action, do you see? But he's blowing it in one way and another, and the whole thing's going to explode in space, I'm afraid. And I hope to God it doesn't, because we can't afford, you know, another mess like this, these incompetence. Now, uh, what is said in here is these people are for world domination, and the, Jew and the group I'm talking about were not. They were largely, partly financed, for instance, by the uh, by Rhodes, the Rhodes Trust. And the how Miller got into this was he was the chief Rhodes trustee. Mm -hmm. From 95 when he came back from Africa to his death in 1925. All right. Okay. So this was a, it's an, it's an Atlantic block. It, this, you know, Strite, Crown Strite, S-T-R-E-I-T, Union now, Union now with Great Britain. All right. He represents what this group wanted. Clarence, S-T-R-E-I-T. If he's still alive, he probably lives in Washington. I had his daughter in my class, and uh, or as a visitor, but not as a student of mine. And he uh, was built up by this people as the only solution. This is in my book. His name and when it happened and by the round table people. By the round table people. And it was his book, Union Now, which came out in 1938, was called anonymously in the Round Table magazine by Lionel Curtis, the only way it was headed. It was then reviewed anonymously in the Christian Science Monitor by Lord Lothian as the solution of our problems. And what it is, is essentially a union of the Atlantic bloc. Yeah, not world domination. Not world domination. Of course, this was Rhodes' idea. Right. He wanted the United States in the English uh, uh -huh. All right. Secondly, these people are not pro-communist as I know them. 
And certainly the round table group, the Miller group, the people that I'm writing about, and I notice I fall in the only in 1940, mm -hmm. which is the end of the Morgan Bank, when they had to incorporate, because of the inheritance tax and so they had to incorporate. And they were before that a partnership. Where you, they, when did the Council of Foreign Relations form? It was originally established by a group here about 1919, okay. but they had in, in the group that we went, it's the inquiry. The inquiry was the post-war planning group set up by the Morgan interest in 1917 in the United States, of which the uh, technical head was uh, the head of the American Geographical Society. Oh, that was in my book. No, no, no. Oh, yes, National Geographic. Ella, who was it? No. Well, it doesn't, it's in my book. You see, my names are slipping me now. Anyway, it's called The Inquiry. There's a whole book on it, and it's called The Inquiry, so you can find it by looking up that title. But you can find it also if you can look in my book. The unfortunate part is it's not in the paperback. It's naturally, it's in the first time when they were falling in the thing, which is uh, in the big uh, version of it. Uh, the Inquiry uh, got together in Paris and agreed to establish an organization out of which came the Royal Institute of International Affairs. And that Royal Institute of International Affairs had branches in all of the Commonwealth countries, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, eventually in India, and they even, uh, uh, I think, had one somewhere else, uh, Pakistan, when it divided, they established one. But in the United States, of course, they didn't have to because they had the constant final relations. But when they came over here, uh, coming back from Paris, they found that a movement had begun here already to form a Council of Foreign Relations, so they moved in and took it over, and they could do that because they represented Morgan. Mm -hmm. And in that crowd was uh, Willard Strait, who was a Morgan partner, and he died at the Peace Conference of the Influenza. And, of course, um, the man who was the active, uh, supposed to be, Lamont, Tom Lamont, great guy for revealing this, but then they became absolutely sour and are now denouncing me that I'm a member of the establishment. And because I'm, you're repudiating it? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. Really. I'm baffled. I'm baffled by the whole thing. I don't know why they're doing that the way they did. I don't know why. I can think these guys are just trying to make a living. I think they write anything that they get paid for writing, which sure. is my feeling about it. So, uh, now, I was uh, angry about this. Then somebody called, wrote to me from the University of Nevada, I believe it was, in Reno, I think. And he was very angry over what was going on there, over this. Now, this is in the 71? And no, this would be 73. 73, that it came to your attention. Oh, well, when did, no, this came in the election of 72. 72. The okay. spring of 72. Okay, fine. That was right after it came out. Yeah, I think. Okay. And in 73, oh, in, in 73, somebody called me. Now, I can give you the exact dates on this if I can get to the papers, but I don't have them anyway. And he wanted me uh, to do something to stop the influence that this book was having in Nevada, particularly as promoting anti-Semitism. Because there's a group of people who are using this book, and they're total nuts. I get letters from all the time. I can show you some of them if you want. Complete nuts. Who claim that this is a Jewish conspiracy, that it's part of the same thing as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which we now know as a bizarrest Russian police forgery of 1905. It wasn't. It was written by the... Uh, by and what? this is the same thing by as... Madame Blavatsky the disciples. Nuts. And the Illuminati were founded in 1776 by a Bavarian named, I think it's White Weisskopf. That's how I saw that. And that the Illuminati are a branch of the Masons, and that they took over the Masons, you see. And uh, the whole thing is a nightmare. Right. That all secret societies are the same secret society. Now, this was established by nuts uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, there were people who said the Society of Cincinnati in the American Revolution, of which George Washington was one of the shining lights, was a branch of the Illuminati and was a secret society. And therefore, that's why the Masons built the monument in Alexandria 
to Washington, not because he was the first president of the United States, because he was the Mason and the head of the Illuminati in this country, and therefore was the, one of the founders of the Society of Cincinnati. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it becomes, you can't believe it. Now, the, these same conspirators are the Jacobins who made the French Revolution. A woman named Nesta, N-E-S-T-A, Webster, wrote that book. To refute it, my tutor, who's a Rhodes Scholar, Crane Brinton, B-R-I-N-T-O-N, wrote his doctoral dissertation called The Jacobins, in which he refutes her. Do you see? Right. Now, I think at the end of his life, Brinton probably came to feel that he was wrong, that there was some secret society involved in the Jacobins. Mm -hmm. And a student of his named Elizabeth Eisenstein, who's a marvelous researcher, she's now a professor at American University, under Brinton wrote a doctoral dissertation on the founder of the Barbeuf Conspiracy. The Barbeuf Conspiracy was a conspiracy of the extreme left, which burst out in France in 1894 or so, led by a man named Barbert, who was executed for it. But the man behind it was a descendant of Michelangelo named Buonarroti, because Buonarroti and Michelangelo's family name was Buonarroti. Look, if you can, at Eisenstein's book, which was published by Harvard, The Gospel of Station, which shows that Buonarroti founded many secret societies. You see, one of them was the Bob Burke people who are now being praised to the skies by all the neo Marxists, like Marcus and uh, others, you see, as the great heroes because they tried to change the French Revolution from a middle class, bourgeois, capitalist revolution, constitutional revolution, into a Communist revolution. Now, Buonarroti is also the founder of the Carbonari, of which Mazzini was the head in the 1840s, which united Italy in the 1860s. Do you see? So, as if you start with Buonarroti, which, as far as I can see, is 1893 and 1793, 1794, I think you can trace a connection down through these various secret societies which culminate in the uh, Mazzini Carbonari. For example, uh, I'll tell you one thing. Okay. Italy was able to get free from Austria because only because France defeated Austria. Why did France do that? Nobody can see why. It wasn't to France's interest. And yet France declared war in 1859 on Austria and at the Battle of Magenta and Solferino defeated and suddenly made a peace treaty without freeing all of Italy. And the reason we're told they suddenly made the peace treaty without was because the king, the king, the emperor, this is Napoleon III, was so sick into the sight of the blood, do you see? Now, why did he do this? He did this because in 1868, a Carbonaro threw a bomb at him. This Carbonaro was arrested, executed, but before he was executed, the emperor went to his cell, as I understand it, and the Carbonaro gave him the secret sign of a fellow Carbonaro because the emperor of France, in the, who became, was elected president of France in 1848, seized the throne in 51 and proclaimed a new Napoleonic Empire, and was overthrown by the Germans in 71. So he was the emperor for, uh, 70 really, for 20 years, you see. But he had been a refugee from France because he tried to make a revolt in France, I think it was 1829. Mm -hmm. And as a refugee, he joined the Carbonari Secret Society. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, he was, a, he was a private policeman in the Chartres march on Parliament in London in 1848, the year in which he was elected President of France. He's a mysterious figure, do you see? Mm -hmm. uh, so, what I'm 
summing up is this. I do think that there is probably a continuous sequence of secret societies from Buenarati, Babu, Babirth Conspiracy, which is 1894-95, through the Cavanari Unification of Italy, which would be 61, 1861. I cannot see anything since then. It may exist. I haven't really studied it. But I cannot see any connection between the Masons and the Illuminati, founded in Bavaria in 1776. And I can't see any connection between them and uh, and uh, Buenarati. Well, now, but that's what these people are saying. It's all one. Right. And some of the say it goes back to Noah de Well, <laughs> one thing that it seems to me that this conspiracy theory of history is appealing because it's so simple. It's so simple. It explains everything that is unexplainable. And, going wrong. and if you raise one point that doesn't fit, they say, ah, see how clever the conspiracy is. Yes. That they've I want to show you something. This is what they start. They start by showing you a one dollar bill. Mm -hmm. And they say, why is there a, tr a pyramid with an eye over it? Do you see? Mm -hmm. This is the symbol of the secret society. Now, if you ask people, any B secret society, according to them, there's only one, you see. That's right. Now, now the secret society is the song of generations. To, to yes, yes. Now, if you ask the United States government why it is there, mm -hmm. they have very difficulty explaining. And they mostly come up with, it's a, it's the Masons, Masonic symbol. But then you say, why should the Masonic symbol be on the American dollar bill? And they have no explanation. So there is something. If you look at this monument in Alexandria to Washington, it is the pyramid. Mm -hmm. You see, there's no the eye over it is the light. Mm -hmm. You see. Mm -hmm. So uh, I could go further into this, but won't have to because this symbol is at least uh, six thousand years old, and I can give you the history of four thousand B.C. It has nothing to do with the nations. Mm -hmm. Now maybe the nations adopted it. You see. But, has nothing, but I will not go into that. That's a totally different story. Okay, so this man from Nevada, or this person from Nevada called, called me up and said they were having a hard time with the anti-Semites using this book as an argument against Wall Street, against bankers, against Jews, against the communists, and everything else. And they wanted me to debate with this fellow who got in touch with me, who was a professor at the university. Who believed it? Uh, oh, oh, no, he doesn't believe it. He was trying to get rid of it. The same way the fellow who called me from Brigham Young was trying to stop this hysteria which was sweeping that mountain area apparently. And so they said, would you debate uh, Gary Allen and Larry Abram? And uh, I said, well, I'd rather not. Frank, he said, well, we need your help. And I said, well, are they both going to be debating me? And he says, no, there's a doctor so-and-so here who will uh, debate with you, and he is, I think, a uh, medical doctor, I'm not certain of that, but he was Jewish, and what he was interested in was the anti-Semitism part. He was going to debate on your team, on your side. On my side. And they said it's going to be absolutely the strictest thing. We'll be on the air for an hour, we'll be hooked up on telephone through the country, I will be the coordinator, said this fellow, of this, and it'll be a rigorous you will must stay on the subject or I will stop you. There must be no personality attacks or I will stop you. You can each talk for 10 minutes, I think it is, or five minutes it could have been. And then when each of the four has talked, I think it was for 10 minutes, then each will have the right to have a five minute rebuttal or something, you see. Now, in the course of it, I soon discovered that Gary Allen didn't know up from down. And but Larry A... No, but Larry Abram was immensely well informed. He knew all about corporation finance and bankers and who were their partners. He knew he's tremendous. Uh, I, how, how did you find out he, talking to people? I found out from the debate. Oh, okay, that's what I was going to ask. You did go to the debate. Yeah, Larry Allen simply repeated everything that was in here. Right. Uh, when I put in my rebuttal and said these various things, he then started pulling up information at me, some of it I had never heard of. Now, I don't know everything. 
And the new book that's out now, published by the Buckley, I guess it's the Bill Buckley Press, Arlington House, I suppose it's Bill Buckley, I'm not sure of that, called The Bolsheviks and Wall Street. Oh, we've got to go to lunch. The Bolsheviks and Wall Street has lots of things in there that I don't, didn't know. Mm -hmm. Make a stop there. Yeah, well, I told you that. You want to put down there? Yeah. I generally would think that any conspiracy theory in history is nonsense for the simple reason that most of the conspiracies that we know about seem to me to be the conspiracies of losers, the people who have been defeated on the platforms, let's say, the historical platform of the public happenings. The Ku Klux Klan was the... Uh, their arguments and their uh, point of view had been destroyed and defeated in the Civil War. Well, because they're not prepared to accept that, they form a conspiracy, you see, to fight against it in an underground way. And those people who could fight up in the open do so. Those who can't go underground. And it seems to me this is essentially what conspiracy, the Palestinian Liberation Army, it'd be a similar thing, you see. I think, on the whole, they're pretty well a group that uh, you know, has not got really very much share. And so they have to be terrorists. Well, if I can play the devil's advocate, I think yeah. talking about the international banking conspiracy, they have not lost out. They simply don't want any attention. They don't want to draw yeah. the well, yeah. players of the